What's up guys, welcome to The Den and welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Dennis, some of you might know me as Sneaker Den on Instagram. In today's video, we will be covering the 1980s Nike basketball era through the lens of my collection as we go through the different models and stories. Just a quick intro on who I am and what you can expect on this channel. I've been in the vintage sneaker game for just about three years now, curating and selling old school dunks for the most part, but telling the stories and history behind the pairs that I sell has always been one of my favorite parts of what I do and that's why I decided it was time to take it to YouTube. You can expect a weekly dose of vintage gems, passion and culture on my channel so make sure to like and subscribe and join me on this exciting new chapter in my sneaker journey. Now let's get into the video. I thought it only made sense for my first video to start where it all started, 1985 and the mid 1980s in general. Disclaimer to the purists, obviously sneaker culture takes its roots before the 80s and there is much more to it than Nike and basketball. But this era was an unquestionable turning point in the culture and it's an era that I specifically love so that's why I'm gonna focus on that. Designed by Bruce Kilgore in 1982, the Air Force One is arguably the most influential sneaker of all time. Probably the most sold Nike sneaker ever. The Air Force One debuted as a basketball performance sneaker in 1982 before becoming the cultural icon that we know today. I don't own an original 1982 Air Force One. This is the oldest that I own. This pair is from 1995, so I thought I'd show this one. Although this is not exactly an Air Force One model, I thought I'd show this one anyways. This is a Skyforce High from 1985 and you can clearly see the similarities with the Air Force One and this makes a perfect transition for the next shoe that I want to talk about. The 1983 Skyforce Three Quarters. In 1983-84, Michael Jordan is still at the University of North Carolina, and Nike sent him this pair of shoes to start recruiting him. This specific pair is a size eight and is dated 1983. A collector on Instagram actually shared a Michael Jordan signed pair of Skyforces. The pair apparently came directly from the UNC equipment manager. Story goes that Michael Jordan wore these for a bit before wanting to switch back to his Converse, so he took these off, signed them, and gifted them to the equipment manager. There's a super cool pic of Michael Jordan in his dorm wearing these shoes, which will forever be the first Nikes that Mike put on his feet. By the way, if you're interested in any of the shoes that I'm showing, feel free to check out my website sneakerden.com or hit me up on Instagram at sneakerden. Next up, let's talk about the airship. In 1984, Michael Jordan got drafted and recruited by Nike, who promised him his signature shoe. However, the Air Jordan 1 was not ready for the start of the 84-85 season, which is the reason MJ played in an inline Nike basketball shoe for the start of the season, specifically this white and red colorway. This exact colorway, game worn and signed by Michael Jordan for his first NBA game, actually sold for $1.5 million at a Sotheby's auction back in 2021. This is a historic pair, so I'm stoked to have these. These are the three original airships that I own. The natural gray colorway is a size 15.5 and looks to be game worn and signed by Larry Nance Sr., who's the father of current NBA player Larry Nance Jr. And this white and orange colorway in a size 13. Let me know which one of these three colors ways would you pick finally last important point about this model the bread airship was the true band sneaker the NBA sent out a letter to Michael Jordan stating that they would find him each game he wore the bread colorway because of the lack of white color on the shoe and Nike used this story as a marketing tool to promote the release of the Air Jordan 1 however he had not yet worn the Air Jordan 1 and he was wearing the airship this is the 2020 model which in my opinion is by far the most accurate rendition of the original airship shape and they were mainly released through the Italian shop Backdoor Bottega. These could almost be confused for an original pair because I asked my boy Andu C on Instagram to give these a vintage look which I absolutely love. What do you guys think of what Nike has been doing currently with the airship? They've been releasing a lot of colorways. Is Nike doing justice to this historic model? Alright guys it's time for 1985. Peter Moore, who sadly passed away last year at age 78, is most famous for designing the Air Jordan 1. However, he also designed the Nike Dunk, as well as other Nike models from the time, like the big Nike Terminator or conventions that all share a very similar DNA. Here I have an original 1985 Nike Dunk High in the University of Las Vegas colorway, which was part of the Be True to Your School pack. 
The pack included St. John's, Villanova, Michigan, Syracuse, Kentucky, and Iowa universities, as well as Georgetown, which was the only school which got a Terminator rather than a Nike Dunk. The shape on OG Dunks is very notably different from all the retros that followed from 1999 up until this day. I do like that Nike made a 1985 line of Dunks, the original shape of the model. Unfortunately, in my opinion, most of the colorways are questionable and the sizing is extremely weird. They fit very small. If you're ever picking up a pair go at least one size up. As many of you probably know, the Nike Dunk was a performance basketball shoe which was made for college athletes to match with their uniforms. Something that was really cool about OG Dunks was that the boxes matched the colorways of the shoe. There were also a few player exclusive versions. Kentucky had by far the most special pair with a Wildcats branded tongue and heel. You can find all these unicorns in this Japanese archive book. I'll leave a link in the description. Moving forward, the big Nike probably bears the most similarities with the Air Jordan 1 silhouette. Here I have two dead stock pairs from 1985. The white and blue colorway is a size 12 and this super rare white and orange colorway is a size 14 and a half. The overall shape is nearly identical to that of the Air Jordan 1. I would say the main difference are the shape of the toe box and the perforations, as well as the midsole and the big Nike branding on the heel. Obviously there is no Wings logo, but the outsole is the same, pretty much identical. The model was famously worn by Charles Barkley and Manute Bull, among many others. Cool personal story that I have with this pair, Manute Bull's son Bull Bull, who currently plays for the Orlando Magic in the NBA, picked up a few pairs from me over the years and I managed to find a pair of retro big Nike lows from 2017 in his size which I had to hook him up with and he seemed genuinely happy to learn about the shoe and to rock it for a photo shoot so that was really dope next the holy grails for a lot of people 1985 Air Jordan 1s there were a total of 16 colorways in the high top version of the original Air Jordan 1 as well as two colorways in the low top I currently have six of the 16 colorways and another one is actually on the way. I have to start with these two Chicago's and Breads. These are the most historic and legendary colorways of the set. Although they're definitely a fan favorite, these are probably two of the easiest colorways to find. By the way, this is a dead stock bear, which is crazy. The tag is still attached. The shape is beautiful, crazy. Next up, I have the natural grays. These are often called the neutral grays, so watch out for that. This is a pair of Royals. Finally, I have a pair of the Powder Blues and Metallic Blues. These are definitely harder to find than the other ones. I love this trio in particular because these are all size 13s, which was also Michael Jordan's personal size. We know that Michael Jordan wore a size 13 on one foot and a size 13 and a half on the other. That's as close as you can get to having his size, so that's pretty cool. Also, size 13 is my size, so I'm definitely trying to complete a size 13 set, so hit me up if you have any. Before I move on to 1986, here are two pairs of less storied 1985s, but I thought I'd still show you guys. First up, we have this pair of soft quartz, a very obscure model that you don't really see that often. It kind of looks like an Air Force One in a way, but it also has this tennis kind of vibe to it. This is a size 13 and it's dead stock with original box, which is really cool. This is a Penetrator High, size nine, also dead stock with original box. This silhouette is also not very known. I would say it's reminiscent of the blazer silhouette, which also has more of a tennis DNA to it than basketball. Moving on to 1986. Conventions are some sort of mix between an Air Jordan 1 and an Air Force 1, and I'm not entirely sure who designed them. It could be Peter Moore, it could be Bruce Kilgore, it could be both. There's actually a distinction between the team convention and regular convention. Team conventions like these two models have the traditional Nike Dunk color blocking with one predominant color and white as a secondary color. The regular convention looks more like the natural gray version of the Jordan 1. However, the differences are not only in the color blocking, Blocking, you might see a difference in the wings and the color on the team convention is pretty much identical to that of the Jordan 1. You can especially see the difference here on the inclination of the wing as well as on the heel where the team convention again looks very very similar to the Air Jordan 1 heel while this one is a bit different. Next up in 1986 the Nike Mac Attack. Mac Attacks have definitely had a moment in the past couple of years since the pandemic and OG heads will definitely not like it but Travis Scott has undoubtedly played a huge role in the model getting the attention that it's been getting. He picked up a pair from Riff LA a few years back and wore them courtside to a couple of games in the NBA and posted a few fit pics with them on feet. 
LeBron James also wore a pair of Mac attacks before a game. The pair that LeBron wore was the white version. He actually borrowed these from Migdalian, who's a vintage collector on Instagram. And to be perfectly accurate, the pair that LeBron wore in that pregame pick was actually the version with the turf sole, which is a bit different from this one. The Mac attack was tennis legend John McEnroe's signature shoe back in 1985-86. These two were the only two colorways that released back in the day, the gray being the most widely commercialized while the white one is much harder to find. The reason for the excitement around the pair also comes from the fact that the model has never been re-released since 1985. I love that the Mac Attack came in this unique box back in the day. I hope they bring it back as well this year. Daniel Arsham actually picked up a pair for me last year and it went straight to feet. By the way, I have a very good condition size 12, size 7.5 and, and size 7 for sale. So check out my Instagram or my website as well for that. Moving on to 1987, here is a pair of Delta Force AC. The shape is quite similar to the Air Force 2, which you could find a lot of NBA players wearing back in 87, 88. And I also did a comparison with the New Balance 650s. You can see there's a lot of similarities on the way the shoe is constructed. I think this one is actually even better and I definitely wouldn't mind if Nike did something with these. Brown snake skin. These I'm actually selling for super cheap on my website. Check those out. These are a size 11. Finally, this is the natural gray colorway. It has the same grip tape material that you'll find on the 1985 Jordan 1. Let me know if you also think that this silhouette is quite underrated. Finishing up with 1987, this is a unicorn pair of dunks. This is the Air Pro version. The shape is still the same as the 1985 original dunks. Dunks were retroed for the first time in 1999. So this 1987 pair of dunks is quite an anomaly. There was also another version of the dunk with a plastic patch instead of the print on the wings. But these are very, very hard to find and there isn't a lot of information on these. So I think these are really cool. Finally, I want to end this video with this pair of 1989 Jordan 4s. Unfortunately, original Jordan 4s do not hold up at all. Because of the nature of how Jordan 4s are constructed, unlike the Dunks Jordan 1s, which have a stitched sole and don't have an air unit, the Jordan 4s just don't hold up. You can see that the whole midsole is falling apart, so I won't even risk taking these out of the box. But it's still pretty cool to have an original pair in hand. You have a little piece of foam just lying around in the box. Box. The Jordan 4 definitely followed the Jordan 3 DNA that Tinker Hatfield brought to Jordan Brand after Peter Moore designed the Jordan 1 and Jordan 2. Jordan Brand and Nike definitely took a whole different turn after Tinker Hatfield, so I thought it was pretty cool to include the Jordan 4 in this video. All right, guys, so that's it for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, make sure to let me know in the comments. I'm just starting on YouTube, so I'm definitely trying to improve and learn from my audience. If you don't want to miss out on my next videos, make sure you subscribe, and I'll see you guys next week.